Hello and welcome to uh, derivation of electric field due to a thin, infinitely long wire. The goals for this presentation are we want to use what we already know about electric fields due to point charges to build equations for more complex objects. We're going to start out with an infinitely long line of charge or a charged wire as we'll see. And then later we're going to derive electric fields of rings of charge and infinitely sized charged disks. So what do we already know? Well, we know what the electric fields look like and how to calculate them at points in space surrounding positive and negative point charges. For a positive point charge, we know field lines radiate outward. For a negative uh, point charge, they radiate inward. How do we know this? Well, recall that we define field direction as what would happen to a small positive test charge placed in the area. So if you imagine placing a positive charge in the vicinity of this positive point charge, it would repel in the direction shown. If we place a positive charge in the vicinity of this negative point charge, it would attract to it. So we can see why the field vectors are the way they are. We also know that from Coulomb's law, uh, we've derived the equation that the electric field is kq over r squared. So how are we going to use this point charge equation for more complex objects? Well, what we're going to do is think of this object as being made up of many point charges, infinite amount of point charges. And so for our very thin long wire, we're thinking about it as a line of charge. So a single uh, thickness line of positive charge going off to negative and positive infinity. And we're going to see why that's necessary later to think about it as going off to negative and positive infinity. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select a point in space where we want to know the value of the electric field for this wire. Then we're going to break the wire up into very small parts that resemble point charges. And we're going to calculate the electric field of each of these small parts and then sum them or integrate to derive an equation for the electric field of the wire itself. So um, after we do all of our simplification, we'll have a compact equation that we can apply to actual wires that are charged. So the object in question is an infinitely long, thin line of charge. You may be thinking, well, this has nothing to do with anything I've ever seen in the real world. How can we have something that's infinite in both directions? How can I even visualize that? Well, one way you can do it is by thinking of yourself as a small... Um, bacteria or, or small object that's kind of living near a wire. So if you picture this wire is so gigantic compared to you and it appears like it goes off to infinity and negative infinity, like you can't see the end of the wire. So what does that mean to us? It means that whatever result we come up with will be valid for points very close to a charged wire but not points very far away from it. So here's the wire in question, our infinite wire, and notice it has a single layer of point charges, which is what we want. We want to know, hey, what is the electric field at the point P due to this wire? What does this wire's electric field look like at point P? So what we're going to assume is that this wire is infinitely long, both directions. Um, the wire has uniform charge spread across its entire length. So obviously the total amount of charge it holds is infinite. But we're only interested in the fact that if we break this wire up into two different equal length segments, each segment has the exact same number of charges. That's going to be important. We also assume that this wire is thin to the point where it's one charge thick. So now, first thing is we're going to define the radial direction from the top point charge shown to the point P. And then we're going to say, what is the electric field due to just this point charge? We can see the direction of the field will be exactly as shown. We're going to call that DE. Now DE is an infinitesimally small portion of the electric field of the entire wire. It's called a differential, which is a very small amount. 
DQ is another differential which refers to a very small amount of charge, specifically the point charge, how much charge is on that point charge, DQ. Now if we isolate DQ as shown, we set up ourselves an axis system, Y and X as shown. So X goes through the point P, Y axis goes along the length of the wire. We can break up um, the wire into small segments, DY. That segment only encompasses the individual point charge we're looking at. So we so far have defined three differentials. We've got DE, which is the small amount of field, DQ, which is the charge generating that field, and DE, which is the length of wire containing that charge. So if we want to know what is the electric field of the entire piece of wire, the infinite wire, the whole thing, then that would be the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of our small electric field. If we were to um, blow up the section dy and look at it more closely, we would see that that section of wire contains only charge dq. And if we look at any section of wire that has length dy, that section has exactly dq because of the fact that the wire is uniformly charged. So we're going to define linear charge density, lambda, as a constant charge per unit length for this wire. In other words, how much charge is in each meter of this wire? Coulombs per meter is a constant. And that's called lambda. And so that would be dq, small charge, divided by dy, small length. So lambda is equal to dq dy, equation 1. Fine. This equation 2 comes from the Coulomb's Law electric field equation. And if we substitute in lambda dy in place of dq, then we generate equation 3. So notice all I did was simplify equation, well, rearrange equation 1 to be dq is equal to lambda dy, and then substitute into equation 2, giving us equation 3. Now we're going to define theta as the angle between this radial direction and the x-axis. And using these definitions, now we see that the Pythagorean theorem gives us r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared to the one half. Now, notice x is the distance from the origin to the point P, y is the distance from the origin to the charge dq. And we're going to keep it consistent like that. Notice the one half is square root, same thing. We're also going to define tangent theta as opposite over adjacent or y over x. Now taking our equation 3 and substituting in for our r value gives us equation 6. So this DE differential is the small electric field generated by one point charge. If we were to integrate it along the entire length of the wire we would get our net electric field for the entire wire which is what we're trying to do here. Now what we need to do is imagine we have a small amount of charge dq on the bottom of the origin, the exact same distance away as our top point charge. We would see the electric field due to that point charge on the bottom would look very similar to our dE, correct? In fact, it would look like this. Right, so as we can see, it's the same exact length as DE, but it points in the opposite vertical direction. If we look at these two vectors that we would generate when we would go to do our integration, we would see that adding to tail, or integrating, gives us the blue vector here, which notice is a horizontal vector. So what we see is that the Y components of these two vectors cancel each other. So is the case for each point charge as we integrate. There's going to be an equal and opposite y vector above and below the origin. So our net electric field then, when we go to integrate, is only going to be this x component summation. 
where we project DEX, uh, excuse me, when we project DE along the X axis and get DE sub X. So how do we uh, define DE sub X? Well, we see we have theta on the left and also theta on the right due to the vertical angles. And so now we know how would we find the horizontal component of DE? It's D cosine theta gives us D sub e, e, DE sub X. So now what we have is equation 7, which is DE sub X equals everything we had before times cosine theta. And now if we want to determine what is the net electric field of the wire, we need to integrate DE sub X. The only issue with integrating this right now is that we have two variables that are going to be changing, hence the term variables, and um, we don't want to integrate with two changing uh, parameters. So let's look at what we have here. We've got k as a constant, lambda as a constant, um, x is a constant due to the point that uh, point p being fixed, y is a variable, and theta is a variable. So we need to represent one in terms of the other, y in terms of theta, theta in terms of y. What we're going to do is represent um, y in terms of theta, so we can eliminate that y variable completely. First thing we notice from equation 5, we get equation 8. So now we've represented y in terms of a constant times theta. We also have the dy, which is a variable in and of itself, we have to get rid of. So we're going to take the derivative dy d theta, which gives us constant x times secant squared theta. Notice that secant squared is 1 over the cosine squared, so we get equation 9. Simplifying and multiplying through by the bottom differential d theta gives dy equal x d theta over cosine squared theta. That's equation 10. So now we have a way of eliminating dy and we have a way of eliminating y, but we're not going to do that. We're going to uh, simplify our um, math. So x is a constant. We're good there. And now we know y is equal to x tan theta. So that means that the denominator of equation 7 becomes x squared plus x squared tangent squared theta. So all I did was take the y squared and substitute in for x tangent theta, that quantity squared. We can represent this x squared plus x tan squared theta as x squared times 1, which is cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta. Notice that doesn't change anything. Plus x squared sine over cosine, which is tangent, that quantity squared. So the sine and the cosine come from tangent. The cosine over cosine comes from just the number 1. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute. So here, if we were to um, combine terms over the denominator cosine squared theta, we get a cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. And so what does the trig identity tell us? It tells us that's equal to 1. And so now we've simplified this to x squared over cos squared theta. So the denominator of equation 7 is x squared over cos squared theta. Now take a look at the dy equation 10. Notice that has a cos squared theta. And notice it has an x. So you can see things are going to cancel here when we plug into equation 7. If you have any questions on this, uh, take a look at these slides again if necessary until you understand the derivation. So here is what we're left with. Plugging in both equation 10 and equation 11 into equation 7 gives us DE sub X equal to a slightly more simple equation 12. This equation is definitely something we can integrate. K is a constant, lambda and X are both constants, so really this is just the integral of cosine theta D theta. Now, if we want to integrate this, we need limits of integration. So far, all we have are negative infinity in the y going to positive infinity in the y. So we can't use that anymore. So we have to ask, what would happen to theta 
as y goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. And immediately we see that if y is at positive infinity, we can see that this angle theta is going to continually increase as we go toward positive infinity. Eventually in the limit, theta will equal 90 degrees, which is pi over 2 in radians. If we were to go to negative infinity, we can see theta starts at 0 and goes all the way to negative infinity y, which would take us to negative 90 degrees, negative pi over and so what we really want is integrating from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 in terms of theta. To carry out that integration, we get sine theta going from our limits of integration, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Plus our limits of integration, we get the final result, which is 2k lambda over x. So pretty simple, the final equation, right? The electric field at the point P is 2k lambda, which is a constant, over x. And it makes sense that the electric field weakens the further away we get from this wire. So here's our final result as a vector. Recall that we're only going to get a horizontal vector due to the fact that the y components cancel for each of these point charges. And so I've written this in terms of the x-axis variable i-hat, uh, excuse me, x-axis uh, unit vector i-hat. And now what we want to do is add one slight, slight uh, modification to our equation. So we're going to define something called electric permittivity. This is a constant that is, we're going to define as 1 over 4 pi Coulomb constant. This is going to be used later in chapters uh, 31 and 32 quite often. Um, in fact, we're going to use it when we define the speed of light, which should be pretty interesting. So um, epsilon sub 0, 1, 4 pi k. If you were to do that math and multiply 4 pi times 9 times 10 to the 9, we would see that epsilon sub 0 is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th. And notice the units, Coulomb squared divided by Newton meters squared. So because of this, we can see that k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub 0. And this is what we're going to use for the rest of the class. K, instead of k, we're going to use 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub 0. So substituting into our equation for the wire, we get lambda over 2 pi epsilon sub 0 x. And that is the final equation for the electric field due to an infinite line of charge. In fact, this equation is also valid for points close to a finite length wire. So this concludes the presentation.